tonight. Hope you've had a good, restful afternoon, and it's been a good Lord's Day for you and your family. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I really appreciate F.H. and his sermon um, this morning. Um, I, every day, every time that I'm around F.H., I'm encouraged, I'm exhorted uh, to love like Jesus. Um, he teaches me uh, what a Christ-like person is and what a Christ-like person looks like. And if you get a chance, just tell F.H. how much uh, we at Highland Heights appreciate him and, and everything that he does uh, for, for our family. And, and we know that we sure do. Um, so we're continuing our study tonight in 2 Timothy. Uh, we're going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2. So if you would go ahead and take out your Bibles with me, and that's where we're going to primarily be tonight in 2 Timothy chapter 2. We are going to be flipping over to some other Bible passages, uh, but uh, primarily going to be there. So, so flip, flip over with me to 2 Timothy um, chapter 2. A couple years ago, um, I ran the Nashville Full Marathon, and I'm not, I don't really consider myself a, a, um, a huge runner, like I'm not, I'm not into it um, extremely like some people are. I, I like to run and, and stay active and, and do marathons and half marathons every, every so often, but I, but I did the, the Nashville uh, Marathon a couple years ago, and let me tell you, that course is tough. Because it felt like it was uphill the entire way. It was it was uphill most of the way. There'd be there'd be a part of it where you'd go downhill and then you'd just go up. Um, I was I was pretty good um, up until about mile 15, and then I thought, okay, they're going to have to get an ambulance to come and cart me out of this place because I'm I'm not going to make it. Uh, but. Uh, uh, but I ran in the, in the National, National Marathon, and, uh, and like I said, around mile 15, that's when I, I started to lose my focus. Um, that's when my, my strength started to wane and I started to, to waver. Um, I started to uh, forget uh, my training um, and really succumb to a, a lack of energy. I mean, any of you, if you've run before, if you've run long distance, um, it is very, very easy to lose focus um, once you get down the path uh, quite a ways. It's tempting. It's so tempting uh, when you're on that mile 15 or you're on that mile 20 to become distracted. It's easily to do, it's easy to do things differently than what you train for. And it's easy to forget that there's even a finish line, that this thing is going to be over. Um, sometimes runners um, must, runners must stay focused. Uh, runners must compete according to the rules um, and not get sidetracked and, and not lose their integrity. And runners um, have to work hard to be able to reach their, their potential. And when we think about the Christian life and, and living, um, living the, uh, the way that God uh, wants us to, the Christian life is, is the same. It's very similar to running a race. Um, and that's one of the major illustrations that Paul makes in the book of 2 Timothy and in the rest of his letters. Um, when, you, when you are in the throes of life, when you are in the throes of suffering, it's, it's easy to forget. It's so easy to forget what really matters. It's, uh, it's easy to do things my own way, to not do things God's way, and it's easy to not give it my all. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul encourages Timothy and he encourages you and I to keep going, to keep pursuing, to keep fighting the good fight, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of hard and difficult times. He encourages us, keep going, don't give up. And the lessons that we learn from 2 Timothy chapter 2 are soul refreshing or encouraging and give us the motivation to keep moving forward and to keep being the people that God wants us to be even in times, even in hard times, even in difficult times. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight, looking at what Paul says to Timothy in 2, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, looking at how Paul gives him encouragement and looking at how we can find encouragement as well. So open up with me, if you will, and look at verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. 
Paul says, and he's talking to Timothy, a young man, he says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He tells Timothy, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a very weighty theological statement. He says, be strengthened by the grace that Jesus Christ gives you. Now, what this tells us and what, we, what we're going to look at in another verse here in, here in a moment and what the rest of the New Testament teaches is that grace, God's gift of grace, is not just pardon. It's not just forgiveness of sins. God's grace is not just a one-time event when God justifies me and washes me clean and takes my sin away. Rather, grace is power. Grace empowers me to live the Christian life. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Paul makes this same point about grace as, as God's empowerment of us to live the Christian life. He says in verse 11 of Titus chapter 2, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And focus on what he says in verse 12, the very first word, training. The grace of God trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So grace, grace, God's grace is oftentimes thought of as just unmerited favor, as just God giving me something that I don't deserve when I'm baptized, when I embrace a relationship with Jesus Christ. But in this context, in Titus, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, it denotes God's empowerment of believers to live the Christian life and to be who God wants us to be. So the grace of God is not not just pardon it's not just forgiveness of sins it's power and if I'm living under the banner of Jesus Christ and if I'm submitted to him he's showering me with, me with grace all along the way and giving me the necessary strength and the necessary power that I need to live in this sin-filled world grace is power and how wonderful it is to be living under God's grace and to receive that power from the Lord Jesus Christ as I, as I keep in step with the Spirit. So look with me in verse 2 and, ha, and, and keep in your mind this idea of grace as power, as, as strengthening Tim, Timothy. In verse 2 of, of 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust, give, teach to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So what Paul is saying to Timothy is that this strength that God has given me by his grace, that he continually strengthens me and continually empowers me to live the Christian life will allow me to fulfill my purpose, will allow me to accomplish what it is that God wants me to do on this earth. All of us are in the process, um, and, and what this church is dedicated to is what, like what Paul says in verse 2, entrusting the word to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's what we're trying to do here, that we're trying to make disciples. We are trying to evangelize the lost, show them the grace that is in Jesus Christ so that they may know him and be built up in him and that they may in turn spread the gospel, that they in turn may teach others also. That's our mission as the church of Jesus Christ, to make disciples, to entrust the gospel into the hands of others who will teach others also, to make disciples. And Paul says to Timothy that this grace, this strength that we receive from God's grace will allow us to fulfill our purpose. We are empowered by God to fulfill our purpose and to do this when we have faith and, and when we obey him. Now look with me in verse 3. This is a, um, a logical flow here. Um, and this is, uh, this is kind of the crux of the matter, this, this verse, uh, verse 3 here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 
Uh, Paul says this, and this is a very significant statement. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So this work that all of us are participating in, in making disciples and evangelizing the lost, the work of the church will, in fact, Paul says, be accompanied by suffering will in fact be accompanied by hardship and toils and persecutions and difficult times. When we participate together in disciple making and as we are being empowered by God's grace and living in Jesus Christ, we're going to face obstacles, church. We're going to face hard times. We are going to face suffering. And the suffering that Paul's talking about is not, not just persecution. Um, of course, the Bible talks about suffering for the cause of Christ in, in multiple places. But when the Bible talks about suffering, it's not just persecution. I used to think that. I used to think that f- to suffer for the cause of Jesus, to suffer for the cause of Christ, oh, I must be persecuted. And that's what suffering only refers to. But that's not necessarily true. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. And this is is the Apostle Paul again. The Apostle Paul makes this point. He says that we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. In this verse, Paul lists several types of suffering that the Christian will experience in his or her life. He lists mental suffering, physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering. Suffering while in the path of obedience to Jesus is suffering for Jesus. When, as I keep in step with the Spirit, if your boyfriend is urging you to have sex outside of marriage and you say, no, my Lord Jesus says, no, I, I'm not going to do that. That's suffering for Jesus. When I'm tempted at work to do something dishonest and to violate my integrity, and I say, no, Jesus has told me that I need to keep integrity. I need to be like God and be, and be honest. That's suffering for the cause of Christ. That's suffering for Jesus. When I'm in a hospital bed, on, on, on my deathbed, and, I'm, uh, and, and I tell myself, Jesus is with me. I don't care what Satan says. I don't care that he tells me that, that God is far from me and has taken my health, but I am going to trust in Jesus Christ and have joy in him. And for the last few moments of on, on earth, I'm going to spread the gospel to the nurses and the doctors that come in contact with me. That's suffering for Jesus. That's suffering like Jesus. And that's being who Jesus wants us to be. And Christ, what, the, what, what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, is while we keep in step with the Spirit, while we suffer for the cause of Jesus in multiple aspects, in a multifaceted way, as we suffer for Jesus, Christ is with me. Christ is strengthening me by His grace as I walk the path of obedience. Now, in verse 4 through 6, this is where I want to camp out tonight and really hone in on. Uh, because in, in, verse four through, in verses 4 through 6 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul gives us three ways. Paul gives us three ways to think of ourselves in our suffering for Jesus. And he, encourage us, and, he, and he encourages us to keep going, to keep fighting, to, to don't give up even in the midst of suffering and hard times. And, and built within these three illustrations, there, there's an exhortation and a promise. There's a beautiful promise within each of these three illustrations. And we're going to be talking about that here in a few moments. So look with me, if you will, in verse 4. Look at uh, verse 4 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul says, and this is, this is the first illustration um, that illustrates our suffering in the Christian life. He says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. 
So a good soldier, a good soldier doesn't leave his post because he gets tired of being a soldier and he goes off in, um, in, into the civilized world, I guess, and, and, and neglects what his commanding officer told him to do. A good soldier doesn't do that. A good soldier has to stay focused on his or her objective, has to stay focused on the ultimate goal. So what through this illustration, Paul is encouraging us to stay focused, stay focused on what really matters in our suffering for Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, he commends Timothy for doing this very thing. Um, in Philippians chapter 2, um, starting in verse 19, Paul says this about Timothy. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. Paul commends Timothy for not seeking his own interests. He has proven his worth as a soldier for Jesus because he focuses on the mission. He focuses on making disciples, on serving the Lord Jesus, and doesn't get sidetracked even in the midst of his suffering. Today, we live in a culture of distractions. We live in, in the midst of, um, of, of, a, of a culture um, that, that it's very difficult for us to stay focused here. I've heard several missionaries before that go off to foreign lands um, and, and preach to those um, who are lost in, um, in, in, in countries that are not as fortunate as we are. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, that, that I'm not grateful for living here. I am so grateful um, to be an American. I am so grateful to live here and to have the opportunities um, and to be blessed. But at the same time, there are a multitude of temptations and distractions that come along with living in this consumer in this consumeristic culture. I've heard, like I said, I've heard missionaries say um, that it is um, they think even more difficult to live the Christian life and to be who God wants us to be um, in in a culture like what we're living in. We're, we're extremely blessed um, to be here, but it is filled with distractions. It is filled with all kinds of materialistic temptations in which I seek other things instead of seeking God. So we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of our climate and the atmosphere that we're living in as we continue to fight and to be who God wants us to be. Now I want to read a passage in Revelation chapter 17, uh, verse 4. Revelation chapter 17, verse 4. The first part of Revelation chapter 17 um, is, uh, it talks about a, uh, the great prostitute who's adorned with jewels and fine purple and all kinds of affluent uh, effects. And, and, and what this passage, what's the what the first part of this passage is, is, is trying to do is it's trying to symbolize cultures and societies that defy God and are driven by pleasure and are driven by wealth. Um, look in verse 4, the description of this, of this prostitute here that's trying to lure God's people away. It says, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and, and pearls, holding in, her, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. Um, so it describes this, um, this, this prostitute who's adorned with nice things and, um, and nice clothes and who, um, who, who's driven by sexual immorality and pleasure. And it's, like I said, it's designed to, um, to, to symbolize cultures and societies that are driven by wealth, that are driven uh, by, by pleasure. It's not just talking about one particular culture or one particular society, but societies in general that are driven by affluence and wealth and pleasure and defy God. And their end, ultimately, the Bible says, is destruction. And when I look in our culture and all of the temptations that we are faced with on a daily, hourly basis, 
That sounds a lot like the culture that we're living in. As our culture slowly and slowly but surely seeps farther and farther away into apostasy, farther away from God and, and His commandments. And we need to be focused. We need to be careful that this doesn't seep into the church. We need to stay focused on what really matters um, in the culture, in the climate that we're living in. So, in the next verse that I'm going to read, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, uh, the Hebrew writer tells us how to stay focused, how we stay focused in a climate that like, like what we're living in. And Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now pay attention to the next word in verse 2. Looking, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So a runner, this, this pictures a, a runner, an athlete. A runner, when they're on their mark, they are focused. They are focused on their goal. Um, and when, when the races begin, he, if, if the runner is distracted or loses their concentration, they're not going to be able to reach their full potential. They're not be, going to be able to endure. Now, what the Hebrew writer tells us um, to do in the midst of living in a culture of, of many distractions is to do this. Fix your eyes solely upon Jesus. And in verse 2, the word that I told you to focus on, looking, in the original language, that is a very powerful word, a, very, a word that carries much meaning and much significance. It's not just referring to, well, I'm, I'm glancing at a particular person and, and I'm doing it casually um, and I'm not really putting a lot of thought into it. No, rather, this Greek word for looking here that's translated in the ESV as looking, it literally means to gaze fixedly, gaze fixedly upon what you are looking at, upon your objective. So how we stay focused in the midst of so many distractions is that we keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. We don't look to the right. We don't look to the left. We keep Him as our main focus, as, the, as our center of attention, and not let distractions take me and pleasures of this world um, take my heart, uh, lead me away from Him, but stay focused solely upon Him. This takes discipline, church. This takes discipline. This takes effort. This takes constant Bible study, reading, being in the Word, prayer, um, serving other people, participating in the work of the church. Um, it takes being disciplined to focus my eyes solely upon Jesus and not to look to the right or to the left. That's how we stay focused. That's how we fulfill our ministry to Jesus and become a good soldier by gazing fixedly upon the Lord Jesus and not looking to the right and not looking to the left. So that we, we need to remember that we are soldiers of Jesus. We are soldiers of Christ. And good soldiers stay focused on what really matters when suffering comes and when hard times arise. So Paul gives us a second illustration here in verse 5. Look with me in, in verse 5 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to to the rules. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Um, an athlete has to keep the rules, of course, to, um, has to keep his integrity if he wants, if she wants to, to earn the crown, to receive the prize. Um, I'm sure many of you um, uh, years ago um, played high school sports, football, track, you know, um, all numbers of things. But, but if you were to break a rule, if you were to do something dishonest or lack integrity, you would be disqualified from that event. You would be disqualified from whatever competition that you were engaging in. So what Paul encourages Timothy to do is to live God's way, live by God's rules and do things um, 
do things according to God's will. So I want to make this point, and this is a point that Paul makes um, in, the, in, in the previous book, in 1 Timothy. Um, Paul makes the point um, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, and I'm going to read that here in a moment, that living by God's rules includes submitting to our authorities. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, it says this, I'm talking about elders, overseers, those who are, who are over us within the church body. He says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So, of course, we know that God has ordained elders to, of the local church to, to rule or to exercise authority over the congregation. And, and our elders, they're, they're not like a, like a secular board of directors, but, but they're like shepherds. They're, they're shepherds that are watching over the flock. The New Testament describes Jesus as our chief shepherd, as the one that we look to and the one that's guiding us. And elders, overseers... Um, as, as shepherds also that are guarding the flock and, and, and protecting us from false doctrine, protecting us from evil, and who are looking out over our souls. And then Paul makes another point in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 about elders. He says in verses 12 through, through 13, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. So, and elders in a local congregation, um, they, uh, they, they are over us in the Lord. They are over us. They are guiding us. They are shepherding us. Now, this means that their authority, the, th the authority that they have comes directly from the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd. God, the, Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, has given authority to his shepherds, his elders in local congregations to govern the church, to rule the church, to make weighty decisions on matters within the church and to rule over the church body. That means that if I, if I rebel against, um, against them when, they're, when their decisions and, and their teachings don't violate um, Christ, then, then I'm rebelling against Christ himself. When I rebel against the authority of an elder and, and, and what they have said has, does not violate um, the word of Jesus Christ, um, in this context, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul's saying, I'm, I'm rebelling against the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But also notice this, that it also says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that they are not just, not just slave drivers that are, that are cracking, <laughs> cracking a whip over us. They, they are those who labor among you. They are those who labor among you. They're, they're, they're not your masters. They're, they're your servants. They're your servants who are working alongside of, of, of us, um, of the members, and, and are caring for your souls. And, and I, of course, I've, I haven't been here very long, but, but I know um, with absolute certainty that we have outstanding elders. Um, I've been with them in elders' meetings and, and having them, them talk about the congregation here. They love you so much. They care for your soul, and every decision that they make is with, with the best intention um, and, and, and is intended to, um, to, to protect the flock here um, and, and to help us to be who God wants us to be. So, so part of living God's way, um, part of living by God's rules is, is submitting to authority, submitting to the, th the authority of elders and also the authority of the, the, gov the governing authorities. We don't have time this evening to go to Romans chapter 13, but Paul makes the point that, that the governing authorities in our society are God's servants that carry out justice and, the, and that uphold the law. Um, um, and, and we are to submit to their authority. So, so living God's way, doing it God's way, and, and, and being who God wants me to be, um, that involves submitting to those who are over me um, and who are, who are those who are lab laboring over me in love. So lastly tonight, uh, the third illustration that Paul makes is that of a farmer in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, that illustrate our suffering for Jesus. So look with me in verse 6. 
He says, it is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. I'm not a farmer by any means, but I have done a little gardening, and it is, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Even if you want to do just a, a few tomato plants and... Um, and, uh, and have a little vegetable garden, it requires much maintenance, much work. Um, so it requires a, a lot of hard work for a farmer to do uh, what he does. And the point that Paul makes is that for the farmer to receive his reward, for the farmer to receive um, the, uh, the produce and his crops, he has to work the ground. He has to work hard. And the point that he's trying to make, he's encouraging us, he's encouraging Timothy to work hard in our service to the Lord, to labor um, in our service to the Lord and to give it all we have. Um, but sometimes, of course, that's difficult. It's difficult to work hard, especially like we talked about before, in the midst of distractions and living in a culture with there's, where there's massive temptation all around us. It's hard to give our all. And, and I've often thought, you know, how, how, can I, how can I work harder? How can I fulfill my ministry to Jesus and bear fruit for his name and, and work hard in the kingdom of God? And I, I love the Apostle Paul. He gives us, gives us so much insight into living the Christian life um, and, and wisdom in Jesus. And, and Paul, Paul gives us the secret um, to, uh, to work harder and to be who God wants us to be. Um, in Philippians chapter 3, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul gives us the secret that we need to work harder, to give our all for Jesus. Um, and so Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 he says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul works his hardest. Paul gives it his all, even though he's in danger of rivers, in danger of robbers, in danger of his own brethren, in dangers of persecution from all around, the Jews, the Romans, many people seeking his life. He's living in the midst of suffering. But Paul is able to give it his all and to work in the harvest of the Lord Jesus Christ because of this. He has made Jesus Christ his ultimate treasure. Everything that he counted as significant before he came to Jesus, his, his Judaism, his Pharisaism, um, his, his education, all of that significant stuff that he used to think was really what, what, what made him the top dog and made him look really cool amongst his peers, he counts as rubbish. He counts as kitchen trash. He counts as loss, all for the sake of Jesus Christ. The reason that Paul is able to press on and to work hard and to give it his all in the kingdom of God is because Jesus is the most important possession that he has. And brothers and sisters, if we want to increase our labor for Jesus, and I hope you do, I hope you want that. I hope, I hope you want to be useful to Jesus. I hope that you want to be a productive worker in the kingdom of God. To do that, we have to do what Paul did, count everything as less important as my ultimate treasure, Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. That's where it begins. That's where it grows. That's where it grows into what God wants, wants me to be. Counting Jesus as the most significant person, as the most significant possession in my life is directly connected to my work and my service in the Lord. So within, as we close tonight, um, all, of th all three of these illustrations give us a promise. Paul encourages Timothy to keep fighting, to keep going, even in the midst of suffering. And attached to all of these is a promise. The soldier that labors in the service of the Lord and stays focused on what really matters will in fact please the one who enlisted him. 
I want to hear someday. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I want to hear those words. I want God to be proud of me. I want God to look at me and say, look, there's my servant Keith who does what I say, who stays focused even in the times, even in hard times, even in times of suffering. And God's promise is that we will, in fact, please him if we stay focused even in hard times. Um, God promises that we will, in fact, be crowned a victor if we do things God's way, if we live by his rules, by his statutes and his commandments. We will be crowned. I, I, I want to receive that crown of life at the end of my journey. I want, I, I want to receive that reward, that crown that Jesus is going to give me if I stay focused and do it his way. And we will, we will receive that, Jesus says, if we do things God's way and we, and we follow his commandments. And lastly, uh, it's in the, the last illustration, we will, in fact, receive a reward. We will receive a reward if we work hard, if we count everything as less important than Jesus Christ and make him our treasure. We will receive a reward from the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the midst of, of suffering for Jesus and, and pressing on and, and becoming like Jesus and fulfilling our purpose and our goal and our mission, be like the soldier. Be like the soldier who stays focused, who has their eyes fixed, has their gaze fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ, not looking to the right or to the left. Be like the athlete who does things God's way, not, not our own way. And, also, and lastly, be like the farmer. Be like the, the farmer who, uh, who works hard, who works hard to receive the first um, share of his crops, and we will in fact receive a reward. And, and know that God, uh, God is empowering you. If you are walking in the path of obedience and you are keeping faith with him, God is showering you with grace upon grace as you go throughout your Christian journey, even in times of suffering, even in difficult times, God's grace remains constant. And he encourages us to keep going and to finish the race. Tonight, if you have any need, if you, if you wish to come forward or if you, if you wish to be baptized into Jesus and, and, and uh, clothe yourself in him and become who he wants you to be, or if you wish prayers from the church, uh, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.